when like there's equality so like do justice i don't know equality i guess equality. would be a big part of justice yeah uh justice involves i believe that everyone has an equal share of getting to what they deserve uh define justice as i guess equality um opportunity lack of oppression justice is a big concept um so there's distributive justice would would be everybody um, having an equal amount or looking at how resources are distributed. Um, there's, um, so you would, could have redistributive justice, which was trying to make things more equal. Um, social justice, I guess, people, um, it's sort of like equality and respect for all. Ooh, um, that's a hard one because I think it's it's very dependent on the group or the individual or the the identity of the group. Um, I think justice is any kind, well, fighting any kind of oppression. Oh God! So I mean, it's a mystery, isn't it? I mean, if you ask ten people, you're gonna get ten different answers to what justice is. Some people are gonna say justice is based on racial equality. Some people are going to tell you it's based on economic equality. You talk to Republicans, they're going to tell you justice is an equality of opportunity to get rich. <laughs> right? So, I mean, justice is, there is no definition. What I'd suggest is you think of justice as a process. It should be a process that has open and fair dialogue and deliberation in which outcomes are linked to evidence. That would be my sense of justice. So for me, there are different kinds of justice, mm -hmm. right? So there's retributive justice, which is mostly what we talk about. I'm more interested in social justice. And so that would be the idea that every human being has the structural position and the resources to be able to develop their gifts. Okay. And so we want to ensure that that could take place. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is just to tax the rich in order to benefit the poor? Yes, I believe so. I mean, uh, what we're talking about is essentially redistribution of wealth, right? Uh, and if you have benefited dramatically from this country and you have more money than you know what to do with, uh, there's no reason that as Americans with our GDP and the amount of wealth that we uh, possess for the world that we should have homelessness and that we should have things like child poverty and that we should be without food, right? If we are truly the greatest country in the world as we claim to be, then, then we should be measured by our, uh, our, our lowest people, right? Our most impoverished, those who are at you know, most risk for crime, right? And uh, Putting them in a position to not be able to succeed for the benefits of others in concentration of wealth is not something that uh, works very well in any society. No, I think um, we do need to tax the rich, but not so much to benefit just the poor. But when we do, at an economic side, we do have a progressive tax reform system. There generally is, that is the best way to help reduce income inequality within states. Um, I think the rich should be taxed more. Um, because they benefited more from the society and um, including lots of government subsidies and so on that go to the rich um, through financial and corporate and home ownership, et cetera, et cetera. So sure, I believe in um, the need to um, have a, uh, for the government to be able to amass resources to make sure that everybody is able to lead a well, good life. Okay. Um, I think that um, the way that that f question itself is configured represents a worldview in this society. Um, we all benefit from living in this society and we all have obligations to each other. Mm -hmm. and. The way the relationships of production are currently structured, it enables some people to get very, very rich at the expense of the people who actually are doing a whole lot of the work. So absolutely, I think it is fair to tax because I think right now, the way our system is set up, it actually is designed to benefit the wealthy. So what we want to do for me is reorganize the relationships of production, not just distribution, mm -hmm. so that people, when they work, are paid a livable wage. Because I am not the least bit convinced that your average preschool teacher is worth a million times less than your average head fund manager. Mm -hmm. People gambling with my money, yeah, probably we don't need them. 
a preschool teacher, a janitor for the bathrooms here, we need them. So I'd like to see them pay because they actually help us. No, I don't think, because I think that the rich w work their way up there and they don't deserve to like, well I mean like, well everybody should be taxed on this, but like the rich work their way up there so they shouldn't have to like be taxed more to help out the poor. Oh hell yeah. I mean that, that, that's, that's one of the great scandals of American life. You can be a billionaire and pay no taxes, send all your profits to offshore banks that fuel drug runners in the Cayman Islands. I mean, if this was a just society, taxes on anybody who makes over $150,000 a year would double. For me, it means that we, I think we have a clash we think we have a clash of ideals. When we're talking life, liberty, that's great. Um, but when we say pursuit of property, I think those ideals clash. I think some people's pursuit of property uh, over, or they think, overrides other people's pursuit of life and happiness, and liberty. Um, so in that case, uh, pursuit of property, I'm, I'm just not sure about. Um, I'd like to go materialistic, right? Um, too materialistic. And we want these certain things that we think we're all owed or that we need. Um, but for the most part, pursuit of property to me um, is a contradictory statement within those three. It means for me sort of the, the core assumptions of classical liberalism. Um, and um, life for me is something much more than mere physical existence, and I'm not sure we take care of either the physical existence or the rich, richer meaning in this society mm -hmm. because people die through lack of health care, etc. Um, liberty means the freedom to, to form associations and to figure out your own notion of the good life, and the pursuit of happiness would be to have the resources to be able freedom, to fulfill those dreams. property rights, and right to life which i would interpret as a life where you ha were able to have your needs met liberty wise you know s be able to say what they want be able to express themselves simply as as well and be able to property wise i would say it has to do with be able to live a life to where you can live comfortably life liberty and the pursuit of property yes um, I guess it kind of reigns, <laughs> it sounds like Americans kind of credo, I suppose. Uh, freedom for the, uh, um, I guess with a capitalistic twist at the end there, to uh, freedom to get as much as you can get, I guess. Uh, you know, historically it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In one of the earlier drafts, it was property, which tells us that certainly in the American tradition, property and happiness are linked. Um, Here's the funny thing that y'all are, are young people, so I don't know how much you've traveled or how much you've seen. I've always been a, a critic of the American government, which I thought was largely a scam and a scandal. But when I was younger, I traveled in Soviet Russia, and I've traveled in communist Cuba, and I've been to East Germany before the wall came down. I spent my summers in China. When you go to those other countries where people get shot and arrested for speaking their mind, you come back to America and you think, wow, America's better than I thought it was. So life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is what makes America special, and it what, it's what makes us different. It's what enables you young people to come in here with a camera and talk to me, knowing you're not going to get arrested. So, so for me, the foundation of all of that is freedom of expression, the First Amendment. That's why this is on the wall. The First Amendment is the foundation of what makes America great. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, it's what distinguishes us from all the other countries in the world. Okay, um, and do you know who John Rawls is, the philosopher? Yes. Okay, do, and you know his veil of ignorance, right? Yes, I do. Um, do you think that it's necessary to apply that veil of ignorance in order to have a just society? Okay, see, again, I've written a critique of Rawls. So you're asking me questions about which I can't um, <laughs> Okay, so I think the veil of ignorance makes moral sense in the regard of, okay, when we consider what is the good and what is just, 
Should we operate just out of our own self-interest or should we truly consider what is good for the community and the world in which we live? Mm -hmm. If what we mean, if what he wants with the original position is to ask people to step out of immediate self-interest, I think that, that that is actually a very important aspect of political life. It can be done though in a variety of different ways. I think that Rawls' understanding of the original position is quite flawed because I don't think we can actually step back. He is presupposing all sorts of things about the nature of social life which actually would come into consideration. So morally, asking us to step out of our own self-interest, yes. Mm -hmm. as, as a deep way of dealing with ethical problems, no, it probably doesn't work. I think that's the only way to have a just society, right? If you have different rules for different people, which we often do, right? Millionaires don't tend to go to jail very often in this country, whereas uh, the poor and impoverished tend to go to jail quite frequently, right? Uh, so obviously that is a system that is broken that I don't uh, particularly enjoy. So I would wish that it was in fact the case that justice truly was blind and that we had equality and that uh, that people were given you know the same advantages and disadvantages uh, based on societal rules. But as you know, we've seen in our culture, that's not always case that's a pretty cool concept if you can make that work but then the other side of the argument is to say yes but you can't erase legacies of racial violence or gendered violence or national violence and so the veil of ignorance is therefore a recipe for being historically stupid <laughs> right so it's a huge debate tibetan monastery go to the monks and say, let's talk about the veil of ignorance. And they're going to look at you and go, yeah, let's talk first about the fact that the Chinese government committed genocide against our people and slaughtered a million of our citizens between 1959 and 1969. They want to talk about genocide. They don't want to talk about the veil of ignorance. So I think your relationship to the veil of ignorance often hinges on how tightly aligned do you feel with the history of your community. So I'm going to give you a situation and then you're just going to kind of see, uh, answer if you feel like that was just, like the result of it was just. Okay. So there's this suspect who is accused of kidnapping a child and um, the uh, interrogator has to um, use torture to get an answer, but um, he didn't actually torture him. He just threatened him, even though it was a bluff. But in the end, that... Uh, interrogator was um, charged for violating the rights of the suspect. So do you feel like it was just for the in interrogator to be um, charged with those violations? Or Oh, gosh. Well, torture is never just. The threat of torture is never just. But then kidnapping a child is also not just. I mean, this is why the job of the police is so difficult, is they, they deal with these gray areas every day. So in your scenario... It sounds like there was almost complete injustice to all of the parties involved. This is why people have lost their faith in the justice system, right? Is that we don't we don't think that that system can produce justice. Um, no, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess it would depend upon the scenario. If he, it would, it, I guess it would depend upon the threat. Um, if he threatened his life, I would certainly say that the police officer was in the wrong. Absolutely. Um, and even if he threatened him without any probable cause. Now, if this is the suspect, uh, and that's later been deemed, then I would guess that my, uh, you know, kind of pushback would be a little bit less if that was inf uh, indeed the case. But when you're dealing with a suspect, I imagine it would be in your best interest to keep calm, cool, and collective and not be, uh, you know, giving threats in, <laughs> in, as an authority. Well, we have the rule of law for a reason. And um, while I'm not a great advocate of a liberal notion of the law, because I'm an old lefty, um, I do think that it's important that our police officers follow the rule of law because we have the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. And so by abusing the suspect, he's violating a fundamental principle of American law, and that is frequently used to justify attacks against people of color and the like. So I think that... Um, I think the scenario is, A, a little simple, okay, that mm -hmm. there are a lot of intervening things that yeah. go in there. But um, if I'm going to have to answer just that one, then, yes, the policeman did violate the law. Mm -hmm.